Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Rianne Moore, and I am the Programs Manager of CAPE, the Coalition of Asian Pacifics in Entertainment. Um, CAPE is a nonprofit that has worked for the past 30 years, actually over 30 years, to advance Asian and Pacific Islander representation in entertainment for a better world. We champion diversity by educating, connecting, and empowering Asian Pacific Islander artists and leaders in entertainment and media. And it is my pleasure tonight as we celebrate not only Asian American and Pacific Heritage, uh, uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month, but also Mental Health Month in the month of May um, to introduce this incredibly special and important panel as a collaboration between CAPE and UCLA's Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Um, to speak more about CSS and its story, I am thrilled to introduce the Center's founder, Dr. Yalda T. Uls, PhD. Thank you so much, Rian. Um, I, we are honored to be doing this. This is our second um, live stream with, with CAPE, and we are very, very excited. Um, the Center for Scholars and Storytellers, which is based at UCLA through my faculty appointment, is much younger than CAPE. We started in 2019, and we exist to bring together researchers, bring together storytellers and adolescents. Um, to ensure our mission is to ensure that there, the power and um, and harness the power of entertainment media to um, create op to help storytellers and support storytellers who want to create authentic and inclusive content for adolescents ages ten to twenty five. So we believe authentic and inclusive representation is not only um, a moral imperative, but also d is good business. So we do a lot of research around that. Um, we've been doing research on mental health since 2019. And um, one of our very first studies found that it was both published in a peer reviewed journal as well as an industry report. We found that a very popular television show after watching it, 92% of the adolescents that watched it went online to look for mental health information. And 88% of them had conversations with someone. Over half of those were adults. So we are very, very interested in making sure that entertainment media really, really um, harnesses that power to support young people around mental health. Um, what you, well, you'll be hearing tonight from a rock star panel, um, and Maya Hernandez is the person that she is now a doctor. She started with us as a fellow, a graduate student, and led this tip sheet that um, you'll be hearing about that we will be releasing very soon. Our tip sheets have been extremely popular starting with our boys tip sheet around evolving representation of boys and men. We're hoping you can go to our site. We can drop something in the chat that will give you a link to our tip sheet so you can see them and you'll be one of the first to know about the um, release of this tip sheet. Um, but basically they are meant to help storytellers um, craft great stories with evidence-based, research-based insights. So Maya's gonna talk more about that. She's gonna talk with this panel. Um, you'll, you have um, an expert who is an expert in the field from UCLA and a storyteller as well as CAPE. So thank you, CAPE, um, for giving us this opportunity and I'm excited to watch the panel. Thank you so much for those words, Yalda. Um, as she said, uh, tonight is going to be just incre an incredible discussion that has been years in the making about mental health in Asian American youth. And as creators, as I'm sure many of you are, how we can really affect this narrative change and really start those conversations through storytelling. And so without further ado, since I know that this is gonna be a long and good conversation, I would love to introduce our moderator and the person that Cape has had the pleasure of working on this project with, uh, Dr. Maya Hernandez, PhD. Woo! <laughs> 
Awesome. Thank you, Rianne and Dr. Ools, um, so much for this privilege. And uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this amazing live stream on Asian American youth mental health and well being um, in the context of storytelling. Um, I am Maya Hernandez, and I am an interdisciplinary scholar and recently received my PhD from the University of California, Irvine, um, where I really focused on the mechanisms of identity development, civic engagement, and mental health as it relates to social media and digital media at large. Um, in particular for historically marginalized youth. Um, I have had the pleasure of being involved with CSS um, for the last three years as a fellow as a, during my graduate studies and now continue to be a collaborator in my postgraduate career. Um, currently, I am uh, the senior manager of NextGen Initiatives at a nonprofit in Little Tokyo, uh, the Gopher Broke National Education Center. And I am leading their journalism institute for high school students and also a, a young adult uh, national program uh, called the National Torch Bears Program. So, um, all of our programming uh, strives to engage teens and young adults through identity exploration and historical preservation uh, to address contemporary social issues such as mental health um, through grassroots community leadership um, and leveraging social technologies and storytelling for um, action and effective communication. So I'm very honored to be here and um, as uh, Dr. Ools mentioned, uh, we're really excited at CSS uh, uh, through UCLA to kind of take action to address uh, the immediate impacts at scale um, by using stories to promote help seeking and help supporting behaviors for teens. And so we really try to work at the intersection of adolescent mental health research and the content creators who bring it all to life through storytelling um, and have just such an extraordinary impact in uh, through media. Um, for young people and to help them think about themselves. And so um, as Dr. Ulls also mentioned, we, we do a lot of um, important research and create evidence to suggest that there is power in media to, to start the conversation around mental health with majority of teens um, looking up uh, resources for mental health and discussing mental health with their friends and family. And so, you know, these are things that really inspire us at CSS. And so um, early on in my time as a fellow at CSS, uh, I also began thinking about um, authentic representation of Asian American populations and in particular Asian American youth. And so we started uh, an AAPI representation working group at CSS in 2021 as well, uh, where we got to actually hold a think tank with uh, numerous leading experts in academic and entertainment fields to come up with key aspects of, of telling the story of Asian American youth and mental health on screen. And so through that um, and through many iterations and this amazing collaboration we have with CAPE, uh, we will be launching an evidence-based uh, tip sheet um, in the very near future for content creators, uh, really focused on how to authentically, inclusively, and also representatively portray Asian American youth and adolescent uh, mental health experiences and, and well-being um, on screen. And so um, as we continue to do this work collaboratively across the experts and the key stakeholders in different uh, fields uh, of Asian American youth mental health and storytelling, um, it is my honor to bring out our panelists for today who are key experts in the field around this. And uh, we will be diving in a little bit more from their perspectives of Asian American youth, youth mental health and, and how it can be um, better represented on screen. And so um, I'm honored to bring out our first panelist, uh, Dr. Anna Lau. Um, Dr. Lau, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Lau is a professor of psychology and Asian American studies at UCLA. Um, her translational research on risk and protective factors on youth and immigrant families um, is, is so critical in the field. And her research um, also spans the identification of racial disparities in youth mental health services and has really informed uh, the efforts to study implementation of evidence-based practices in community settings. Uh, Dr. Lau also trains doctoral students in the delivery of evidence-based psychotherapy for youth and teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in Asian American mental health and the psychology of diversity. Welcome Dr. Lau, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. 
Uh, next, I'd love to bring out, uh, we have Naya Susikoff. I always butcher that, but I hope I, I got that. Um, Naya is the founder, the EP, and the producer of at Soft Seas Entertainment. Uh, during her 10-year tenure at Walden Media, Naya has cultivated um, the critically and commercially acclaimed series, The Babysitter's Club, uh, for which she won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Children's and Family Viewing Series. Uh, she has actively vocalized her impact in the industry as the vice chair of CAPE um, and a creator of AAPI Female Empowerment Group, A+, and a member of the Television Academy, the PGA, and Women in Film. Welcome, Naya. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, and last, but of course not least, uh, we have our uh, third panelist, uh, Grace Cowell from CAPE joining us. Hi, Grace. Um, Grace is the operation manager for CAPE, and prior to joining CAPE, Grace was the founding director of operations at Compound, which is an art and culture nonprofit located in Long Beach. Uh, Grace has also previously worked in operations and visitor engagement at the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, MOCA in LA, and abroad in downtown LA. She is also a co-producer of J-A-M-O-J-A. Jamujaya. thank you. <laughs> uh, which premiered at Sundance Film Festival this year in 2023. Welcome, Grace. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, so as you can tell already, uh, we have a very incredible uh, group of panelists. So we're going to dive right into a couple of questions that have been uh, in my mind uh, as I definitely help to co-create this tip sheet and as we think about Asian American mental health and, and storytelling um, in contemporary days. And so um, the first question I, I would love to pose to the panel is, um, very broad, but kind of open for interpretation. What has been your experience in your respective roles and expertise um, of Asian American uh, adolescent experiences and, and developing and mental health and, and what have been some challenges? Um, so I'd love to maybe start with Naya. What, is, what has been your experience? Sure, um, well, first of all, thank you, Maya, for having me and, and Kate. Um, this is probably the mo the closest my parents will ever see me getting to a PhD. So I appreciate being in the same room as all of you. Um, and and you know I think it, it is a broad question, and I think you know approaching it from the perspective of the business that I'm in, working in, in Hollywood. Um, I think watching you know we can speak to our own use, but I I really kind of think about how it works um, watching our cast of Babysitter's Club uh, kind of grow up and grapple with the experience, specifically Mamona Tabata, who played Claudia Kishi. Um, watching her both come into her own realizing the weight and the importance that a character like Claudia had on the community and other kids her age was fascinating. And at the same time, you know, in real time, I watched her really kind of wrestle with that idea of what it means to, in her case, be an Asian, Cana Asian, uh, Asian Canadian, a Japanese Canadian, and um, also the shift in what was happening with the Asian hate uh, moment during COVID. And so that I think was really, you know, it was, it, was, it was heartbreaking, but it was also fascinating to see, you know, how she really kind of transitioned from being this very kind of happy-go-lucky, you know, this is not something that I deal with in my day-to-day -day life because I live in Vancouver and I see Asian people around me all the time, to really understanding the importance and the weight of the mouthpiece that she had and uh, almost the, I, I, I guess I would say the responsibility of it. So it was, it was both a proud moment because she really stepped up to the plate, um, you know, and also the other girls were really supportive and really there for her. But at the same time, just heartbreaking in the sense of you, you don't want to see children, adolescents that you care about going through the same things, dealing with the same issues that we did. Um, and, and to know that generationally we're not at a point where it's changed is, is pretty rough. So I would kind of speak to that in terms of the challenges. Obviously on the other side of that, the fact that she did have this wonderful network of peers who were supportive of her, that um, she got to have the experience of having a group of 
adults who also really embraced her and brought her into the fold. Um, I took her to her first really uh, big kind of all Asian event at the end of her Gettable Gala. And for her to kind of just be welcomed in so, um, so lovingly was really great. So that I guess would be a plus on all of this. Yeah, that's awesome. We definitely pulled inspiration from the Babysitter's Club for our tip sheet. And I think, you know, it is a key example of not only is it deficit space, but I think there's a lot of strength in having that strong network and that support system, especially as a teenager um, and as an Asian American teen or, um, you know, Japanese Canadian teen, I think having that network exemplified on screen is so important for young people to connect with. So, yeah, we're very happy that that story was able to be told. Um, I think I want to switch gears a little bit to Dr. Lau in terms of your experience as um, an, an academic and a researcher in this space. You know, what has been your role in terms of trying to disentangle the youth experience and the youth mental health around Asian communities and um, what have been some challenges in, in studying this in, um, in kind of the research field? Um, thanks so much, Maya. And I, I also really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So. Um, yeah, this is bread and butter for me, thinking and fretting and, and worrying and uh, about, you know, um, mental health right now in this moment where, you know, we have the U.S. Surgeon General really highlighting and underscoring that um, youth mental health is in crisis right now as we've emerged from, you know, really the twin pandemics of um, COVID and really a, a rise in um minority stress and racialized um, experiences of, you know, interpersonal and structural discrimination and just, um, you know, really grappling with what this means, um, not just for um, Asian American youth, but other youth from marginalized backgrounds who've really witnessed a, an increase in really overt hate um, uh, and, and violence. Um, so we're in a time that feels kind of dark right now, um, and uh, this is, um, you know, very, very present in, in, in the mind of sort of my discipline as a child um, and adolescent clinical psychologist. Um, over the years, you know, I've approached this problem uh, from a number of angles. One is really kind of worrying about um, access to effective mental health care that is responsive to the needs of um, racially and culturally diverse youth and Asian American uh, youth and families. So uh, worried about getting care and getting effective care that's going to be responsive to the needs of Asian American youth um, and their caregivers who are, are really kind of essential to supporting mental health treatment. So, um, you know, we've been really thinking about wh where do we put care? How do we uh, make it accessible? How do we make it um, seem relevant to the needs of uh, and the beliefs of um, Asian American youth and families? Um, and then in informing like what that care should look like, really trying to understand and, and center the needs of Asian American youth and, and families both from the standpoint of what makes youth vulnerable to depression, to anxiety, to feelings of suicidality, um, and really understanding what are the unique kinds of um, cultural and racialized experiences um, that Asian American you know, adolescents face and really how that shapes um, patterns of like presenting difficulties and um, how to recognize those difficulties. Um, but also really trying to make sure that we pay attention to those protective factors and those community and familial strengths and um, to you know, do this in a way that um, is gonna make our interventions much more potent and acceptable um, to our community. So these are some of the big problems that we've been grappling with. Um, we um, know that infrastructure for mental health care for, for all Americans is very, very broken. Um, so for youth and in reaching youth, um, we've been increasingly been really relying on our, our public school system to be the de facto mental health system for youth. So um, our lab has been um, really working on bringing preventive um, as well as sort of more crisis based interventions into school settings um, where we know the barriers are, are lower uh, to, to reaching youth and families. So, so those are some of the things that, that we're working on. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. Yeah, it's it's incredible to see the intersections of both kind of our academic spheres and, and how we tell these stories on screen and how it's so important to, to consider a lot of the nuanced cultural and kind of accessibility responses, right? And so, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that insight and um, for doing the incredible research that you do. Um, Grace, I also wanna pose this question to you as a, a producer and also in the nonprofit world and, you know, how do, and kind of someone as an advocate to, to increase uh, authentic representation on screen, you know, what is your take on uh, kind of the understanding and telling the stories of Asian American youth development, mental health on, on screen, and what are some challenges that you find? Yeah, thank you so much. And so a large part of what CAPE does um, is we've always kind of started with the mission that representation begins on the page. Like you have to have the people writing the stories and writing stories with nuance and with the allowance of having a multitude of narratives for Asian American characters and having, um, and not just having like the single story, like the one narrative, but being able to have enough um, Asian American writers out there to write these narratives. And um, so a large part of what Kate does is we um, reach out and we, you know, we have our emerging, fellow, uh, emerging writers fellowship and we foster that writing, but we also have other fellowships and pathway programs that look into um, the mid-level executive, the people who are buying the stories and the grants to be able to give out to, you know, emerging filmmakers to make these stories, right? So like, in order to have that, that real representation, you have to tackle it from the root of the writer, the people buying the stories, the people making and, and being the filmmakers. And so that is a large part of what we do um, at Cape and is also, I think, a huge part in how we like, I'm going to take it back to um, when I was a young girl growing up and what I could or couldn't see on screen and what um, what made it possible for me to believe in the realm of, like, I think even Cape existing as an org is a radical statement, right? Because um, we're saying that Asian Americans can take up space in entertainment. We can take up space on the screen, on stage. And... Um, that is a large part of how um, I think being able to kind of show that this is a place that Asian Americans can kind of go and find stories and stories to relate to, especially for um, Asian American youth growing up who may be raised by parents who are um, speaking a different language from, from them, for instance, who are learning to navigate, navigate the biculturalism of living in two different worlds and two different cultures. Um, these are spaces that people go to find the stories that help them connect and help them kind of express themselves. So um, that's part of like, I think the, the where, where I find my role in um, what we do to tell stories, to understand the um, Asian American kind of adolescent youth and teenager experience. And in terms of challenges, I mean, as Dr. Anna Lau uh, mentioned, there's been a lot of challenges, especially as of late, we are living in a time right now where um, things feel especially, I think, hard. Um, we keep living through these like once in a lifetime crises that just keep happening. <laughs> I, I was, you know, part of the generation that grew up under 9-11 and we move into now with the pandemic, uh, stop Asian hate, things that just keep coming one after another. And we have, um, I think people who feel continually uh, disaffected and disconnected um, because of the way we've kind of moved to a lot of very uh, virtual modes of, of what previously were more in-person um, gatherings. So um, something that in terms of challenges of what we've had to do, you know, CAPE is all about building community and a large part of the challenge of how do we build community when we previously were able to gather in person and, and bring together, um, you know, people who are interested in, in the entertainment industry um, in person and um, how we've been able to kind of, I think, pivot and move through the space by uh, allowing ourselves to um, grow in our virtual um, reach. So that's a little bit of what the challenges have been for us. Yeah, thank you so much, Grace. And I, I hear that. And I think it's it's great that I think we're working collectively and um, activating within our communities in order to 
to address these, um, you know, critical issues that are affecting our youth, but also, you know, what are our solutions? How do we harness the strengths in our communities? And so I think these are all incredibly important points and um, a great segue to my next um, next question. Um, but I also just want to do a quick shout out to our audience. Like, please, I encourage everyone to um, put in questions. We're going to have some time towards the end to take some audience questions. And so uh, please feel free to put them in the chats uh, wherever you're, you're watching this live stream. And so um, my, my following question is kind of a, a follow up to kind of this narrative that we're all talking about and flowing in terms of mental health. And uh, Dr. Lau, you had mentioned, you know, the Surgeon General recently put out a report of concern around mental health of our youth in the US. Um, and I think, you know, at CSS, we've been honing in on this and really trying to understand what are the mechanisms in which, you know, media can support young people's mental health. And um, even today, there was a, a report by the American Psychological Association um, giving recommendations on how to support uh teenagers as they use more social media and you know what are the pros and cons of that and how is that affecting their mental health and so there's a lot to think about when we think about mental health at large but also especially for our Asian American population and our Asian American youth um, as as we mentioned before uh, many youth majority of youth report uh, using and looking up um, mental health resources on online um, after watching a TV show um, and a lot of um, a lot has created a, a bridge for them to also talk to their parents about mental health. Um, and so although it's really not at the forefront of um, a lot of media outlets or even research in my opinion, um, Asian American youth are, are very deeply affected by this and um, also knowing that Asian American communities are significantly less likely, 60% um, less likely to be specific from a um, recent report by the uh, Department of Hu Health and Human Services um, in the US, um, they're 60% li less likely to seek out mental health services and support um, compared to their um, non-Asian counterparts. And so um, what are some of your thoughts um, on this as respective leaders in your in your field. And so um, maybe I will uh, bounce it back to Grace and maybe if you want to continue your thoughts on, you know, how, how do you have, what does this mean for you in terms of knowing that they're, um, they're less likely to seek out support and you know, maybe what role can you play as a leader in your, um, in, in CAPE and in your field um, to amplify this? Yeah, no, this is a, a really great question and one that I feel very personally, um, like strongly about because it's um, being being able to be open to talk about mental health and seeking mental health services is something that our community needs to be better at doing because it impacts people in my life and people, I'm sure everyone knows or has their own experiences. Um, I, uh, you know, my background on it before I came to Cape, I actually went to law school and was a lawyer for, for two years. And I went into law school as in simply as a result of being very good at school, right? You know, you're very good at school and you keep going down the path of like people being like, oh, you're really good at doing that. Do you want to keep doing that? And, you know, we're going to keep applauding and giving you these accolades. Um, I have a lot of friends who were there also as a result of being very good at school. I think that Asian American youth do feel, you know, being the children of immigrants, being you have the, the, the pressure of like comparison to other people's um, children or like the pressure of your parents, you know, saying, you know, and, and this is not everyone's experience, of course, but if your parents maybe immigrated from a different country, you know, feeling like there was a sacrifice made for you or feeling like to fit in or to earn your place where you are, you know, you have to prove um, that you deserve to be somewhere. Right, so it's something that I think we touch on uh, well in the tip sheet, the, the pressure of the model of minority myth. And um, and so the, the kind of pressure this kind of creates and the resulting kind of um, stigma against seeking out mental health services if that's needed is something that is really huge, I think, in, um, in our community. And what we can do uh, is continue having these conversations, continue making sure that, you know, everyone talks about May as Asian American and PI Heritage Month, it's also Mental Health Awareness Month, you know, and we sh 
it shouldn't only be one month, but it's also a time to like really talk and be open about um, and candid about the difficulties, but also about taking away that stigma from seeking that help. Yeah, I love what you were saying of, of continuing these conversations and honestly creating these spaces for people to feel connected to kind of what maybe they're going through and um, and connecting it to kind of contemporary issues or, or things that we all might be collectively struggling with. And so I think that's a great point. Um, before I get to Dr. Lau, since I feel like this is her expertise, I would love to hear Naya, your perspective on kind of just hearing the, the cultural kind of stigma as you know grace mentioned and also just these the the sp disparities in, in seeking out mental health services within our communities and you know what does that mean for you as a storyteller yeah i mean it, it's interesting because i feel like i've had a lot of discussion around this conversation uh in the last couple of days and and not having anything to do with this it's just something that kept coming up and so you know you have the i know a lot of writers who kind of like grace you know went and got their medical degree or were lawyers or did something else first because that's what they were expected to do. And then they finally had, you know, had their moment of revelation or their, you know, slight mental breakdown and, and had to go and, you know, make that change that was going to make them happy. And they had to process that. Um, and then the, on the other side of the coin, there's that stigma against sharing your feelings, against admitting weakness in any way, shape or form. Um, and I know a lot of writers and creatives who have spoken about that with me as well. So it, it is very much in the conversation and it's very much something that we're, we're very luckily in this community. I think people are, are, are fairly open um, just because that's just the nature of the business, I think. So um, you're, you're essentially airing your childhood trauma every single time you open your mouth <laughs> in a writer's meeting uh, or creative meeting, but uh it's not always like that for everyone. And so what we can do as creatives, as storytellers, is to show situations like that, to show and depict, um, we always say, see it to be it. And so, you know, it's moments like in Never Have I Ever when Desi is talking to a therapist following her father's death. It's um, heroes and heroines like Naomi Osaka, who, you know, very vocally and openly said, I need to deal with my own mental health issues before I can be a you know tennis player and, and focus on you know those other parts of my life and so the more we can do that and showcase people really authentically going through those experiences um, without stigma I think the better it's going to be for kids coming up yeah I couldn't agree more thank you Naya for also kind of expressing a little bit of vulnerability of I think all of us have experienced when we do our work um, we are expressing some part of our own uh, either trauma or experiences. And, you know, we, we hope to, to leverage that as a strength in our work. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that because I think that really holds true to, to a lot of us um, who are in this field, um, kind of trying to address this, uh, um, this uh, topic at hand. So thank you. And um, yeah, and Dr. Lau, what is your response? And especially as someone who is creating um, evidence-based uh, psychotherapies and treatment plans and um, processes that are more accessible, you know, what is your take on kind of this um, accessibility gap? Well, I just, I just really want to underscore and sort of snap everything that Naya and Grace sort of shared about the power of, of these narratives. And, you know, I think one real big drawback of the work that, you know, psychologists do is we generally are helping one person at a time, right? It's a model. It's not really a structural model. It's not really a public health model. Um, but what media can do actually has, has, has the potential to have so much more reach around, um, you know, uh, addressing and, and really reducing stigma and, um, you know, really presenting um, a diverse range of authentic experiences that really can help people feel understood. Um, we know, you know, one really, really robust um, method of anti, you know, anti-stigma mental health campaigns is really exactly what you're saying, really to um, you know, amplify the message that people that you care about, you identify with, and you admire in this world have have these struggles. Um, also, I think it's increasingly important to have 
um, you know, authentic and realistic and demystifying portrayals of what it looks like to get help. You know, I think we've had a lot of really unhelpful portrayals of, of what mental health is, what mental health treatment looks like, um, that, you know, doesn't necessarily, right, convey um, or, or motivate, right, people to get help. So um, the kinds of, you know, um, really lovely and accurate portrayals of what, you know, evidence-based therapy might look like, um, I think that could be really, really helpful too in, in these portrayals. Um, you know, and I think there's always a challenge too to, um, this speaks to, I think, what Grace was saying. We just need a lot more representation and a lot more dimensionality and variability in the types of stories that we see. So yes, absolutely. Are there a lot of shared experiences around sort of generational trauma and feelings of, you know, maybe an acculturation gap between, you know, first and second generation um, Asian American family members? Absolutely. Um, there are also sort of other experiences and, and differences that are probably equally important to portray um, and, and, and really, um, kind of uh, sending messages about what the cultural strengths are as well uh, is, is probably something that we need to underscore. And then the only other thing that I will say, and, and this really touches upon the, the model minority myth of it all and how damaging that is. And we have really good research on that, that you know when young people internalize the model minority myth, um, you know, it really has uh, you know, direct connections to mental health status. Um, and so we really do want to do our best to disrupt that and to really kind of raise consciousness. I think about like, where does that come from? Who is well served by perpetrating that myth, right? Like, I think that there's very something very empowering about studying Asian American studies when, you know, um, students come to college and really learn like how that was a real trap and divisive political um, tool um, that uh, that was, you know, kind of wielded against all people of color. Um, that kind of um, sort of knowledge and, um, you know, I'm just going to plug ethnic studies in K through 12, like that is something that we can do, honestly, that can have a direct impact on wellness and mental health and things like coalition um, across uh, marginalized groups. Um, so, so yeah, I just, uh, I think sort of this, I'm really happy to be a part of like hearing about how, um, you know, how, um, old media and new media and social media can all really kind of contribute to, um, you know, um, making these, uh, sort of, uh, disseminating this information that I that I think can be really healing and helpful for the community. Yes, definitely. And I think something um, you all were saying kind of around the model minority myth also reminds me that it, it's often easy for people to portray Asian American as a monolith as well. And I think there is a lot of diversity within diversity. And so highlighting and amplifying the diverse experiences, even within our Asian American community and, and the youth in Asian American communities um, is going to be so important to, to make sure that their stories are heard and that their experiences are heard. Because there's a lot of intersections with, um, with socioeconomic status and um, a lot of other social dynamics that we um, often don't think about when we are trying to portray a story or even doing research on um, these populations. So I really appreciate kind of the culmination of expertise um, again on this panel. Um, and, and to that end also, um, you know, being a teenager is hard enough um, as I'm sure all of us remember being a teen. Um, but many of us probably grew up um, not with social media every five minutes. And so, um, you know, coinciding with, you um, all of the nuanced uh, development during uh, teenage years, such as identity, their changing bodies, expectations, and just social tensions and cultural tensions between your family and, and friends and peers. 
um, you know, thinking about all of these things um, that contribute to being a teenager and an Asian American teenager, probably, um, you know, do you think um, the entertainment uh, media is doing a good job portraying um, this experience for Asian Americans um, currently? Um, if so, would love to hear examples. And if not, would love to hear your kind of uh, thoughts around uh, ways that it can be improved or um, ways that we can do better at the intersection of um, academia and, and content creation to, to amplify these authentic experiences. Um, I'll start with Dr. Lau, if you wanna kick us off from your experience. Um, do you think uh, media is doing a good job portraying this experience right now? I mean, I've been really excited about, uh, and I think probably everyone in this room has been really excited about what seems to be great content um, coming out, you know, everything A24 puts out, uh, um, these really authentic experiences. I I, I agree with Naya that um, Never Have I Ever has, you know, just been, um, I think, a wonderful um, series um, that's really um uh what uh it's it's really provided a lot of um disruption to stereotypes i think which is really useful and helpful you know um the asian american characters on that show are very obviously dimensional um and this is what happens right when um when you're you know you're writing for that complexity and you get to be not background color um not the best friend but the protagonist you get a full kind of um complex character. So I think just more of that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and, a, and, a, and, a, and I think that the portrayal of therapy in that show also really just showed like, uh, what seemed to be like, you know, um, the therapeutic alliance was front and center in the relationship right between the therapist um, and, and the and the main character there, um, that I think was you know, pretty, pretty authentic, um, getting called out on behaviors. And then also um, that sort of the support um, that you'd want to see. Um, you know, I can imagine maybe a little bit more specificity in sort of um, trying to help people understand what might happen for uh, someone with a certain type of presenting concern. But that's sort of um, <laughs> probably a little bit more for another day or more specialized uh, viewing. Um, but yeah, I've really been excited about um, in, increased representation. I'll also say that I think social media um, and when youth are putting out their own sort of voices on out there um, has been, you know, really fascinating to watch um, Asian American youth really develop, you know, sort of collective identity through their shared experience as Asian American young people, you know, so the memes of it all, you know, feeling sort of immediate understanding of some of these shared experiences, I think is, you know, new and healing um, as well. So I think, um, you know, that's out there as well as, you know, I think a also, people are talking sometimes in helpful, maybe sometimes in un unhelpful ways about their mental health journeys as well on um, on social media. So I'd be really interested to, to understand that a little bit more as well. Yes, definitely. Um, that intersection between um, screen-based media and social media is definitely a topic at CSS we're also interested in. So that's a great point. Um, Naya, I would love to hear your, your take on kind of, do you think the, the, the industry is doing a good job portraying Asian American youth experiences, mental health, and if so, would love to hear examples, more examples, and any other kind of suggestions you think that can be improved. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I have to agree with everything that Dr. Lau said. I, I was nodding very emphatically during most of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think we are doing, you know, we have come far, there's still so much further to go. Uh, Nielsen just did a study of representation in media for API um, Heritage Month. And um, we did a game as, as many good Asians do at, a, at an event the other day that was competitive to see you know, a trivia version of it. And I of course went to the bathroom during the answer to this question. But I do know that the representation on screen was very low. And the fact that I think it was 79% of the people polled felt that 
um, there was not enough and that they were not fully represented. So we still have very far to go. Um, that said, you know, I think shows like Never Have I Ever, Babysitter's Club, Shadow and Bone, um, on an older scale, I think Beef does an incredible job um, of just showing that there's like complex, messy, interesting Asian characters that aren't always perfect. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of great content out there. It's just a matter of, you know, some of it is a little restricted because it's a little older. And I think we need to really have more in the young adult space and, and the kids space. Um, and that speaks to a greater issue that I think all of Hollywood is having, which is the widowing down of kids and family content. Um, we have a great quote from our uh, showrunner for the Babysitter's Club where she said, it's like the streamers are expecting kids to go from watching Paw Patrol to Pretty Little Liars. And, you know, unfortunately, that's becoming more and more true. So I think having more studio and streamer execs who are willing to put their necks on the line for kids and family content, um, especially for mental health and API representation for representation across the board, intersectional representation is important. And then, you know, secondly, I think where we can do our part and be good allies to the educational um, community is being more vocal about what's happening with libraries and schools across this country in terms of books being banned, um, in terms of stories, you know, being kept away from, from kids who probably need it the most. So those, you know, I, I guess I kind of went on a tangent, but to answer the question, I think there's still more work to be done on both sides. Thank you so much from your like very critical and um, you know deep insights from the industry itself. I think it's so important for us to understand where the industry is and where we have to go. And so I appreciate um, kind of the candidness about the improvements we can make in the industry. So thank you. Um, and Grace, what what are your thoughts around um, you know where we are currently with storytelling of Asian American youth and maybe what what's Cape's role in terms of maybe addressing some of Naya's um, suggestions? Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, like Anna, uh, like Naya, I've been loving a lot of the current growth of like amazing representation out there in the shows that were mentioned. Um, there is also a new one on Nickelodeon, Bossy Bear, which is um, a lot of bears, but they are, um, you know, Korean in heritage. And there's a lot of references to that Korean heritage. Um, and so that's an amazing thing for younger children to watch. That I think would be a great thing. As I mentioned before, um, in some of the trainings we do at Cape, one of the questions we ask when we get into like a room with like, you know, people who are maybe executives or at a studio is we say, well, for 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 Asian a Asian Americans, when is the first time you saw yourself on screen? So maybe wanting to make sure that like we can keep creating those models for our children and the people who are growing up now, um, and so um, that is incredible. We're doing well but we have room to grow and in terms of that um as mentioned like better understanding the diversity and the fact that as asian americans we are not a monolithic group you know um it's not just east asians which talk about southeast south asian and we talk about aapi that gets kind of lumped together because of the census des designation the pacific islander really being its own kind of um community that has its own issues and struggles and wanting to recognize that and make sure we disaggregate when we are talking about um, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders or AAPI together. Um, and so I think I mean, that's one of the, the areas I think is challenging and that we have room to grow in. Um, and um, definitely I think just showing um, stories, you know, it's not just about stories of success, it's about stories of resilience. You know, I think that's the most important thing you want to show someone who can fall down and then get back up again. And I think that's, um, that's where we hopefully are. I think that's where we're headed. That's what we're seeing. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of hope in, in using and leveraging storytelling uh, to reach um, the Asian American population as a whole. So I appreciate everyone's expertise on that. Um, so I want to spend the last couple of minutes, we've gotten some really great uh, questions from the audience. Um, we might only have a time for one or two, um, but definitely wanted to pose it uh, to the panel and, and see, get your thoughts on it. And it's very relevant to kind of this conversation and topic that we're talking about in terms of mental health resources, accessibility. 
Um, so we have one great question from Peter Cha, um, who asked, what are evidence-based mental health practices that you wish uh, were spotlighted in entertainment, especially for API youth? Um, so uh, Dr. Lau, I would love for you to uh, dive into this question first. Oh, thanks for that question. And, um, you know, it, it, this is, it's a tough one because evidence-based practices are what we have, you know, data for to support um, good treatment outcomes really depends on the mental health problem, right? Um, but it might be helpful, you know, I guess in broad strokes to move past, I think, very oversimplified and kind of unhelpful portrayals of therapy that it's all about just sitting across from someone who's asking you and how does that make you feel? Um, <laughs> which, you know, is probably not what most adolescents want to get into, right? A room like that. Um, so I think, you know, to the extent that we're going to start seeing, you know, more, you know, uh, vivid portrayals of specific mental health experiences like depression or like social anxiety, you know, I think that opens the door to sort of, uh, um, you know, depicting, you know, what effective care for that might look like. So what does it mean to sort of like expose yourself to, you know, a feared stimulus in a supported way so that you can sort of tolerate, you know, the the feelings in the body know that um, you know you can you can tolerate that and um, still you know engage in all the activities that are fear provoking for you and, and and get mastery over your fear. So you know those are the kinds of things that gosh maybe there are some opportunities. Anxiety is is so pervasive. Um, and rates of it it's, are, are going way up. So, you know, an authentic representation of how one might move past that might actually be pretty, pretty useful. And doing that in a way that's sort of developmentally appropriate for a young person, I think that's, I think that's the challenge. Um, uh, so that's just one example that I can think of. Um, you know, we really are, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, science to sort of translate. So that's where I think these partnerships between content experts and content creators, you know, I think there's a lot of room for great collaboration there. Yes, definitely. I couldn't agree more. Um, we have one other question from Priya Mishra. And um, this is really around the context of COVID as well, um, given that COVID kind of made us change our lives uh, quite a bit. Um, the question is, with the rise in telehealth, so accessibility um, as a question, um, have you seen uh, COVID increase access in some ways uh, to mental health care? Um, so I'll, I'll pass it to Dr. Lau, and then I'll also reframe the question so that Naya and Grace can um, respond to this. But uh, Dr. Lau, any, any thoughts around how COVID has affected this? Um, well, you know, COVID was a huge um, a catalyst, right, to, uh, you know, moving into the virtual world for mental health care, just like everything else. So, you know, it's now very routine to, to deliver um, mental health care via telehealth. And we're learning a lot more that we can get pretty robust effects. And in some ways, sometimes treating people in, in places where, um, you know, that there's their natural environment, you can do a lot more, right? Like it's one thing to come into an office an hour a week and you're not in your natural environment, maybe not exposed to the things that trigger for you um, anxiety or other things. So telehealth did offer a lot of op opportunity to meet people where they are, um, break down barriers to access. Um, and, and we're finding that, you know, you actually can make a strong therapeutic alliance over telehealth. So all of that is great. Um, so I, I do think um, we've been talking for about a decade about doing that. You know, it sort of never went to scale and then overnight it went to scale. So I agree with folks that there was really um, an opportunity that arose out of that crisis. Um, mm -hmm. So that's true. We still have a, a lot of the same barriers, though, to making sure that kids who um, need care can get it, whether it's in person or telehealth. Um, and that's really primarily a structural problem with lack of resources. 
Um, I know that people's waiting lists who specialize in treating adolescents in Los Angeles, it's very hard to get care right now, uh, need way outstrips supply. So yeah. we, need, we need more. Absolutely. Um, and to kind of reframe this question, because I do love this question, you know, I think for Grace and Naya, how have you found, um, you know, technologies, whether it's social media or through the power of um, TV content and movies, um, has this changed over COVID? And do you feel like you have a bigger reach to the Asian American youth population through storytelling uh, to address mental health support? Um, how about Grace? Do you want to kick us off? Sure. And I think in terms of whether it's changed over COVID, um, as mentioned uh, by Dr. Anna Lyle, the, the ability for people to kind of have these meaningful therapeutic relationships um, over something like telehealth is something that I think we saw a real rise of in COVID. And then, but the need for it also was something that really came to a forefront too, right? Um, I think it was mentioned, uh, our Surgeon General recently talked about the, you know, us becoming more lonely as a nation and that loneliness and the impact of that, um, I wrote it down here because it blew me away. He said the biological impact of loneliness is worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, the, the kind of stress it takes on you and, and people and, and the fact that we are, you know, hardwired for, for connection and needing connection to survive. So I think that while I think that stories are very important because they reach people who maybe have no other way to find connections. If they feel isolated, if they feel lonely, if they feel um, like there isn't someone else to turn to, it gives them that outlet for connection. But we also need to be mindful to be building those like villages of support in real life and doing that outreach in real life, especially for um, you know, adolescent and youth who maybe find it harder to to put into words what they're what they're going through. Definitely, I agree. Naya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just to build off of that, I, I think my dog has a lot to say on this subject. Um, <laughs> I I think that you know it's just like Grace was saying. Um, in a lot of ways, it's opened up a lot of doors in that we have so many, you know, more outlets to find that representation you need to find stories that, you know, can encourage um, and and influence young people. Um, and at the same time, I think social media, uh, things like TikTok and, and Instagram and I don't know, whatever the trash fire that Twitter is these days, but like there are more <laughs> ways for people to find community and and to be encouraged to find that community online and uh, through their devices. I think it really is just creating that community, like Grace said, where you can then go out into the world and, and seek people IRL. Um, that said though, I love telehealth. My therapist moved to Rancho Mirage and I do not want to go there. So we uh, <laughs> very good telehealth relationship. Yes. I love that. Yeah. The power of technology as, as, um, Challenging it may be. I think it definitely um, creates some uh, opportunities for access and uh, some opportunities for young people to feel really connected um, to to their own experiences, but to the culture and to the environment that they're in and all the things that they're experiencing, especially as a teenager. And so, um, I definitely. Um, I definitely agree with all of you. And, you know, I, I wish we had another hour to, to continue the conversation, but um, we're going to start closing out. And, you know, what you heard today from the experts really showcase the strength of partnering across multiple disciplines and stakeholders um, for this work. And we truly can't do it without um, each and every every one of us uh, working together to kind of improve Asian American mental health, um, you know, and, and leveraging media and, and the power of technology and storytelling to do so. Um, so all the research and the real time evidence uh, shared um, by academics and content creators is uh, tells us that really content can be a, a successful um, vehicle and way to reach teens. And so, um, you know, we at CSS are constantly studying what is the best way uh, to reach teens um, to the 
right information um, to, to avoid misinformation and, and, and kind of foster really supportive conversations um, when they get stimulated by a story. And so uh, CSS continues to work with uh, many people like CAPE um, who care deeply about this issue. And we also work with uh, the Joy Gorman Wattel Company, uh, the Joy Coalition, uh, streamers like Ninja, uh, Mandy Tifi and Wondermind and YouTube and many showrunners, uh, really again to to be very cross disciplinary and and engage many stakeholders um, to ensure that this work is evidence based and um, has a great impact for our communities. And so, as we celebrate Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month and Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, we really strive to work collaboratively to build these tools. Like we said, we are going to be launching this tip sheet very soon uh, as a collaboration with CAPE and CSS. Um, and we really hope that this will help content creators to continue to write these very powerful stories to, to support teens, um, Asian American teens, and um, the diversity of teens that are in our country today, um, and those around them um, who are experiencing dynamic times in development and uh, really celebrate their strengths as well. So uh, thank you all so much. And I'm going to hand it off to Rianne also from Cape to, to close us out, but thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, oh my gosh, thank you so much all four of you for this conversation. Um, the way Maya that you were able to lead it um, really just brought so much relevance and I think also just the urgency of an undertaking like this into really uh, into just so sharply aligned. So uh, we're really appreciative of that and um, I'm really excited to tie this to our upcoming tip sheet in collaboration with CSS. I think that it's just, a, so heavily researched, so vetted, and we hope that it will be a resource for years to come. And we are just all as different entities grappling with and, you know, working towards strategies to support youth. So I just once again want to express my gratitude towards you, Maya and Anna, who are really on the ground engaging with these individuals and communities doing this research and may also making it understandable to the rest of us. Um, so we really appreciate that. And also to you, Naya, for bringing those stories and those narratives to life um, with as much intention as you can. And also Grace, um, speaking for CAPE, uh, like, and also for me speaking on behalf of CAPE, we are just so invited, like so grateful to be invited to um, these conversations and also to be invited to support so many different parts of this process. And so to everybody who's listening, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for dropping your questions. And please be on lookout for our tip sheet on our socials. Um, thank you again to the four of you and to everyone. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Happy API Heritage Month and Mental Health Awareness Month. And we look forward to joining you next time. Bye, all.